Hi, I'm David Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. Geometry as a mathematical discipline is not only an object of study in itself, it's also a tool for studying nature and mathematics. In particular, it's something that you can use to study itself. And an example of this is the theory of moduli spaces. In this playlist, I want to talk about the simplest example of moduli spaces. Uh, they're called Hilbert schemes. And in this video here, I just want to give you the first example. Okay, so let's uh, look at what are the basic objects of interest here. So we'll start by fixing an abelian category C. If you're not so familiar with this notion of abelian categories, um, just think about modules over some ring R. Okay. Next, we're going to pick some sort of object M inside C. So if you're looking at uh, modules over R, that's just some R module here. And what is this uh, Hilbert scheme, Hilbert M? Okay, so that's uh, what uh, we want to study. Okay, it's just a set of sub-objects of this M. And uh, in the case of the module category, that just means the set of sub-modules of this M. Since it's an abelian category, you have for each of these sub-objects the corresponding quotient. So you can look at M mod M. So this will be the quotient module in the case of this uh, module category. So these are sets, and I guess these are equivalent descriptions of them. Um, but what's interesting is that we're going to put some sort of geometry on this. Okay? So by putting a geometry on this set, so firstly, this gives rise to lots of interesting algebra. Uh, um, algebra geometric objects. Uh, so there are lots of interesting geometric objects that arise in this way. And secondly, uh, by putting a geometry, sometimes you can study those objects, uh, this, these sets as well. So that's the reason why we do it. There's sort of two sort of reasons. Now, strangely enough, um, even though these are equivalent descriptions, uh, if you're an algebraic geometry to especially, um, there is actually a tendency to look at the quotients, and we'll see this in a little while later. Okay, so often these Hilbert schemes are also called plot schemes. The next thing is that often we refine this definition here. This set can be quite big, so we like to break it up if we can, so that we can study smaller parts of it. Uh, so what we'll often do is that rather than looking at all the sub-objects or all the quotient objects, will restrict the types of sub-objects and quotient objects we'll look at by fixing some invariants or some conditions. And we'll see some examples of that. Okay, so let's start with the easiest type of category that we uh, can, which is vector spaces over some field K. Now, usually when you do this theory, you have some sort of finiteness condition that's involved here. And what finiteness condition is that? Um, so uh, it's often either finite generation or Noetherian, something like that. So here we're just going to look at finite dimensional vector spaces. So we can take this V to be K to the N, N dimensional vector space. And we'll look at help V, the set of subspaces um, of uh, V. Uh, and uh, what we can do is rather than looking at all the subspaces, we can fix that subspace W of V to have a particular dimension. So we fix an integer D between 0 and N. We can look at help dv, which is going to be a subset of this help v, consisting of subspaces w of dimension d. And this is a very, very important set. It's called the Grassmannian um, n, d. Okay, so unfortunately, I won't be able to show you how this is actually a geometric object. Okay, it's in fact a manifold. I'll do that uh, later in this playlist. Uh, but this is uh, very, very important in mathematics. But hopefully you've seen some examples of this before. So the example that I'm hoping you've seen before is when d equals 1, and at least if k equals either the reals or the complexes, okay, here you're just looking at one-dimensional subspaces of n-dimensional space, and that is just the differential geometer's projective space, p to the n minus 1, n minus 1 dimensional projective space. Okay, so that's what you get here. Uh, uh, this thing and hopefully you'll have seen that this uh, is a manifold okay uh, either a real manifold or complex manifold in fact it has an open covering by um, affine space okay so either affine real or complex space so this is how most people actually view the projective space uh, but if you're an algebraic geometer often not always but often <laughs> you actually look at the case where d equals n minus 1 okay 
And that's going to be the algebraic geometer's uh, predictor space p to the n minus 1. So really, what you see here is, um, rather than looking at one-dimensional subspaces, you're looking at one co-dimensional subspaces of k to the n. Okay. And that's also uh, something about how the theory is set up. Is often it's nicer to look at quotients rather than sub-objects. Okay, so let's have a look at a slightly more complicated uh, category here. That's going to be the category of modules over the polynomial ring Cx. So uh, the module that I'm going to pick the object in this category is just the ring itself as a module over itself. So Helber M is just a set of all sub-modules of this, which just means ideals I of Cx. And in this case, this Cx here is a principal ideal domain. So it's this I is generated by some single polynomial P. Now, there are lots of ideals, okay, because there are lots of polynomials that you can pick. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, restrict this like we did before. We're going to put some conditions. So what's the condition that we want to put here? Well, uh, this P here, if you fix the I, this P is defined up to associates, up to a unit which is a non-zero scalar. Um, but it doesn't matter if you change by uh, non-zero scale, it's going to change the degree of this p. So the degree of this p is fixed. So we can uh, fix an integer d, and we can look at only those ideals which is generated by a degree d polynomial p. Okay. So that gives you some subset, which is rather nice. Okay. Now, this is the time when often it's better to look at quotients. Okay. So, of course, uh, uh, we can recast this condition, you see, in terms of the quotient. So instead of looking at these i's, you can look at the corresponding quotient, cx mod i, and the condition that the degree of p equals d is just the quotient c of x over i, as a, this dimension as a vector space over c is just d. Or equivalently, you can say that the length of this module, uh, as a cx module, is just d. So this is one of the reasons why often it's nice to look at the quotient instead of the subobjects. Inside this category, all these sub-objects, uh, okay, as long as p is non-zero, they're all isomorphic to each other. They're just free of rank one. The quotients, however, are all different. Okay, so you can really try to uh, distinguish them from each other in this way. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why it's good to look at quotients. But there are other ones as well. Okay. Okay, so here we have this set. Okay, and it's rather nice. And then the question becomes, how do you put a geometry on it? And uh, I, we're going to look at this in just a naive way in this video. Okay, so let me show you how. So the point is that if you're given this ideal, okay, uh, there's lots of generators for this ideal, but you can pick one canonically if we say that the uh, uh, degree of p, of p is equal to d. We can pick the modic polynomial that generates. So it'll be x to d and by d not zero. And then these sets will be in bijection. Okay, that'll be in dijection. And what is this as a set? Well, as a set, this is also in bijection with just this uh, uh, set of coefficients. Okay, so you just look at the coefficients. Okay, and so basically, this is just d dimensional affine space with uh, coordinates a d minus one down to a zero. So it looks like here we have this Hilbert scheme, Hilbert DM. And it really is a geometric object. It's just d-dimensional affine space. Now, what I want to do is I want to view this set in a different way. Um, and this is quite common in algebraic geometry. I'm going to use the algebraic geometry duality. And the algebraic geometry duality, there are many facets to this. Okay, uh, But one thing you can do is to any ideal, you can look at the uh, variety or the uh, scheme of zeros. Okay, but uh, in this case here, it's a fancy way of just saying that if I take uh, this polynomial, I can look at a set of roots. Okay, let's look at the set of roots. What's the set of roots of such a polynomial? Okay, it's just uh, going to be uh, uh, d points on the affine line. You just have d points on the affine line. That's going to be the set of roots, okay? Uh, you may think of this as a d point set, but you have to be a little bit careful because some of the roots might be the same. So you have to remember the multiplicity. And so really, it's a d-point multiset inside A1x. OK, great. So uh, really, we've changed a way, uh, different way of looking at things. So this is the map from here to here. And similarly, if you have uh, d roots, OK, 
if you have a set of d roots, of course, you can build back this ideal. Okay, so that's part of the algebra geometry duality, but in this case, it's quite easy. Uh, okay, you have one linear factor corresponding to each root, and you just multiply all those linear factors together. Okay, and that will give you this polynomial here. If you made sure that those linear factors were also all monic, you'll get the monic one here, and that's the inverse bijection. Okay, so that's the d point. Uh, uh, that's how you go from d point multisets in A1x uh, to this description here. So here, this is rather nice. Uh, here we're just studying geometry. We have some affine line and we have a set of d points inside here. Okay, and we're looking at, well, you can move those d points around in some sort of way. Okay, and they kind of looks like, oh, they should form a geometric sort of object in that sort of sense. But how do you find what is the geometry there? And this gives it a different type of viewpoint of the geometry. So the first thing you may think of is that it will, if you have d points on the affine line, okay, well then that just corresponds to, um, say the d points are alpha 1 up to alpha d, it's just a d-tuple. Um, now, the thing you've got to be careful about here is that when you talk about sets and multisets, remember, it's an unordered list. Here, this is an ordered d-tuple. So you need to... <laughs> basically uh, look at unordering, like the unordered set corresponding to this. So one way to do that is what you can do is you can take this ordered set and look at all the different ways you can reorder them as well. Okay, and that's that, uh, that collection of all the ways you can reorder a d-tuple will correspond to a d-point multiset. And a different way to think about this is that, well, this symmetric group on D letters, you can use to permute the, these D coordinates. Okay, there's an action of this group on this affine space. And you're looking at the SD orbits on side here. So that's a different one. Then you have D that you look at SD orbits. And then you can ask, well, what geometry can you put on that? Well, it turns out that algebraic geometry also has an answer to what this is. So firstly, you have this AD, that's a geometric object, but you want to look at quotients of this. So how do you put a geometry on the quotient of this object? Now, of course, if you just think of AD as a topological space, you can look at the quotient and you get a quotient topology. So you'll certainly get a topological space, but if you want more geometry, how do you do that? When algebraic geometry, you use the algebra geometry duality. Okay, so that means you pass to the algebra. And so the algebra corresponding to AD is just a polynomial ring in the coordinates, alpha 1 up to alpha D, okay, which represent the roots. And here you want to look at the quotient object, which is maximally ST equivariant, so to speak. So when you dualize, you want to look at the maximal sub-object, maximal sub-ring, okay, which is ST invariant. So basically, you're looking at all the SD invariants of this. So all the symmetric polynomials in alpha 1 up to alpha d. And you look at, so this will turn out to be some sort of finitely generated algebra. In fact, I'll tell you shortly what it is. Okay, it's a finitely generated algebra. So it corresponds to some sort of uh, variety. In fact, okay, it's clearly a domain sitting inside the domain, which is the polynomial ring in d variables here. Okay. So um, you may think, well, we've got two different ways of looking at this, and it seems like we've got two different geometries. Okay. But fortunately, these two geometries are the same. So there's some interesting mathematics that's going on here. And that, uh, so this uh, viewpoint suggests this very uh, interesting theorem. So how can you check that the two geometries are the same? You check that the coordinate rings are the same. So here you have the coordinate ring, which is the polynomial ring in AD minus 1 down to A0. And here you have the coordinate ring, which is this invariant ring. And these two algebras are isomorphic. And hence, you get the same geometry in both cases. So how does the isomorphism work? Well, fortunately, actually, the bijection that you have here is the one that gives you the isomorphism. Okay, so what was the bijection? To go from here to here, take a polynomial and you send it to its set of uh, d roots, which is this uh, sd orbit of you order the roots however you like and you look at all the different ways you can reorder that, okay? What about going in the reverse direction? Okay, if you know the roots, how do you get, for example, the constant? Well, up to sine, it's just the product of the roots. 
So that, that means that this A0 here gets mapped to the product of alpha 1 up to alpha d. Well, I guess if you do it like that, uh, it's minus 1 to the d times that. Okay. How do you get A d minus 1? Well, this is the negative sum of roots, so you should send A d minus 1 to minus alpha 1, minus alpha 2, all the way down to minus alpha d. And similarly, all the terms in between will get mapped to up to sign the corresponding elementary symmetric functions. And this is actually an isomorphic uh, isomorphism of uh, algebras over the complex numbers. So uh, here, this way of looking at this Hilbert scheme gives you a very interesting mathematical result here, okay, or suggests this, and you can check that this is true. The next thing I want to do is I want to uh, have a look at this sort of viewpoint, D point multisets in A1x, and I want to compactify this. Okay, so we compactify the affine line by adding a point at infinity to get you the projective line. And you may think, well, what about D point multisets in the projective line? And we can do that also using this sort of Hilbert scheme uh, definition. So we're just going to up things. We're going to just compactify what we see here. So we're going to change this mod CX, okay, which is just also the category of uh, quasi-coherent sheaves on the affine line to quasi-coherent sheaves on the projective line P1. And let's suppose the co uh, homogeneous coordinates are X and Y here. And then this M, we're going to compactify this uh, CX, the structure sheaf, to the structure sheaf on P1. And then we can look at quotients of this, which are analogues of what you see here. Okay, and we'll get a whole DM. So if you're not too familiar with what goes on um, in, in this sort of category and how you work with it, um, I'll just tell you the answer and hopefully you can see that it should get something similar to what you see here. So here we're going to work with the homogeneous coordinate ring, which was CXY. And again, we're going to look at polynomial um, uh, ideals inside here, but they're homogeneous ideals. In fact, they're going to be a principal and it's generated by some uh, single homogeneous uh, polynomial. And keeping the D here, uh, that homogeneous uh, polynomial has degree D. And it should be non-zero. So these objects will give you uh, sub-objects of this structure sheaf. That will give you certain ideal sheaves inside here. And you can questions of this, um, and that will give you D points inside P1. In fact, by the same sort of reasoning, okay, if you look at the zeros of this homogeneous polynomial, okay, since it's degree D, you'll get D points if you include multiplicity on the projective line. Okay, so it's exactly the same as what you have here, but now you have D points on the projective line, okay. Uh, so let's see what this compactification is. And again, you can do something similar, uh, uh, but we can't pick this monic. So that's the only thing that's a little bit different here, okay. So what we're going to do is, what does a homogeneous degree D polynomial look like? It looks of this form, A D X to the D plus A D minus one X to the D minus one Y plus all the way down to A zero Y to the D. Now, of course, the question then becomes, well, when do two of these generate the same ideal? Okay, uh, well, I guess uh, only when they are scalar multiples of each other by uh, non-zero complex scalars, so you have to mod out by C cross. Of course, we don't want all the coefficients to be zero. So basically, uh, we want to look at this set of polynomials, not all zero, so it's going to be a, a vector space of polynomials minus the zero. And you look at uh, modding out by C cross. And another way to think of it is it's just the, uh, the set of D plus 1 tuples of coefficients A, D, A, D minus 1 down to A0, those D plus 1 tuples, not all zero, modulo scalars. And of course, that's just PD. Okay. So here we've compactified this example before the Hilbert scheme was AD, and we've compactified it to the projective D dimensional um, space. Okay, and that's help D. So there's some very, very elementary examples of Hilbert schemes. And what I want to do in this playlist is show you more interesting examples of um, Hilbert schemes, how they give very, very interesting uh, geometric objects. And also, strangely enough, these Hilbert schemes um, are, can be studied uh, using lots of tools in algebraic geometry, which you can't use elsewhere. So sometimes, even things that you know really, really well, if you can write them out as a Hilbert scheme, then you can actually understand them better. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.